So I ask you if you had any questions about body language, and if you did, to let me know and email me at bodylanguagequestions at gmail.com. A lot of people did, and they got a lot of questions that I'm going to answer. So if you have any questions, just let me know, bodylanguagequestions at gmail, and I'll answer them for you. So let's start with this one. And it says, uh, do you believe that when you first meet someone, your body can tell you more than your mind can? That's interesting. I see what you're saying. But you got to keep in mind that everything begins and ends with the brain, especially when, when you're observing someone. You're, it was the first six to 12 seconds you see, see someone, so many decisions are made about that person. And you, because what happens is this, you're, you have this thing called the fusiform gyrus and this little uh, part of your brain right in here. I think it's about a quarter inch in. I think I'm right about how far in that is. And that is what collects all the little things you see. All the little movements like Sony's face, their you know, mouth, their shoulders, all those kind of things. Sees the little, little movements in that person and starts collecting all those, right? And then you have the mid-temporal gyrus, which is down here, and it comes up this way. And that collects the larger movements, like when I do this, or you see somebody walking by, or an airplane, or a bird, or a dog running by, or something, it collects all that information. And both of those parts of the brain send these that information down to this thing called the locus ceruleus down there at the, the base of your brain. Now, this is all in a nutshell. There's so much more that goes with this. So if you're a neurologist and you're watching this, I know. But I'm trying to break it down so it's as simple as, as I can possibly make it. So anyway, those two parts of the brain send all that information down to the, to the locus ceruleus. And the locus ceruleus, in other words, starts sifting through that information. It's going, have I ever seen something like this before? Is this familiar to me? Did something like this hurt me before? What happened? What happened last time I saw something like this? Am I familiar with this or whatever? So it starts making all these decisions, not decisions, but it, it helps you make a decision about what you're seeing. And then once that happens, you get that gut feeling. Guys get a gut feeling and women get women's intuition, and which is one of the most powerful things on the planet. So what you're, what's happening is your brain is actually seeing those things and going, ah, something's not right about this person. Or I think this person's probably okay or I'm not sure yet, or something bothers me, I don't know what it is, but there's something not right there. In a nutshell, that's what's going on. So remember, everything begins and ends in the brain when you're observing someone, especially for the first time, those first six to nine seconds. There was a study done at Harvard, and it was called the Instantaneous Impression Study. What happened was this. They had a group of students going through a course for a semester, and they said, look, all students said, look, we're going to show you these short little videos of these professor's assistants that are going to be part of this. And we want you to tell us how much you like each one of these assistants. Uh, just by looking at these, little, these short little clips. They're, some are six seconds, some are 12 seconds, and some are 10 seconds. And they said, uh, so on a one to 10, we want you to grade, grade these people you see. And let us know what you think on a one to 10. Now, the videos were black and white. They're a little blurry and grainy. There was no sound. And it was... Um, just a little little clip, just that first six to nine seconds, right? So they watch one of them and say, okay, I kind of like this person. I give them a seven. And they saw another one and said, I don't like that person at all. I give them a two. You know, I really like this person. I'll give them a 10, you know, to make a long story short. So they did, all the students did this and they sent them through this little, their semester. At the end of the semester, they said, look, you've experienced these assistants, these professors' assistants now. So what we want you to do is grade them again and see what you thought about them. Enough time had passed, so I'm sure nobody remembered exactly what they gave everybody. So they said, okay, we'll do that. So they graded them on a one to 10. And they took the data from the, the beginning of the semester and the data at the end of the semester. They brought them together and they compared them. They said, ooh, something's up here. Uh, we need to do this again because these are so similar. The ones from the beginning are almost exactly the same thing as the ones at the end. So they did it again, and the same thing happened. They compared both um, groups of data and said, oh, these are really similar. The, the, if somebody gave somebody a four over here, quite often they gave them a four. They gave them a nine, gave them a nine, that kind of thing. So to make a super long story short, and to keep this from being horrifically boring, the uh, the outcome was that in that first six to nine seconds, that's when you pretty much make up your mind about somebody when you first meet them. Because you may see them and go, uh, let's see, let's see her. She's nice. She's pretty. And she reminds me of my sister. I bet she's funny. 
And I bet she's a really good person. You don't say that in the front part of your brain, but in the back of your brain, your subconscious, that's what you're, that's what you see. And that's where you're going, okay. So I can that's where you get that feeling. I kind of like this person. Or you may see somebody else and go, let's see, here's that guy. Uh, I don't know about him. He looks like this guy I used to hit on my wife in college before he got married. I don't think I like him. You don't say that in the front part of your brain where you're thinking and all that, but it's that little, you get that little feeling because that locus ceruleus is comparing all those, your experiences with that person, another person, other people that look like that person. And then you go, I like them or I don't like them. So that's what's happened. So it all begins in the brain. So your body doesn't pick up these things. Your brain picks these things up. That's a good question, actually. Let's go to the next one. Uh, what is it you feel is the most important sign you should take notice of to detect a lie? There's a whole bunch of them. One of the first things I usually look for is um, it's it's a look on their face as they're doing it. Are they really into it? Do they break eye contact? Because if they do break eye contact, that means they're relaxed. They're not. Their brain isn't going, we need to keep an eye on this person, make sure they believe us. So I don't have to add anything to it. Their blink rate goes way down because their brain, again, is saying, we got to keep an eye on this person. So we got to make sure that, do they believe us? Do they believe what you're saying? Because if not, I've got to add qualifiers and make this answer uh, sound even more believable. So when somebody, when you get an answer from, from somebody, if it's an important question, then just wait a second. When they answer, go, don't say, oh, okay, just go. And wait for them to see if they say anything else. If they're being honest with you, quite often they'll go, what are you doing? Or something wrong? Instead of, that's why we went out, because she told me that they were going to be there, and I went and they weren't there. She's not the only person that told me that. And I'd heard that during the day, that they may not be there, but that's what I thought they were, they were going to be there. If you keep waiting, and they go, so... That's why I ended up going over there and, and being there for so long, waiting on everybody. So the longer you wait, the more they're going to talk, the more information you're going to get from them. So that's the first thing I usually look for is that is is listening to how they answer and then listen to the to what they give you, obviously what what they answer with. And if I pause long enough for them to go, why are you acting weird? That kind of thing. So that's what I usually look for is, is the the way something looks and sounds in the answer. All right, the next one, uh, what do you look uh, what do you look for to identify a truthful person? Um, I look for eye contact, but not not uh, too much where they're going, there were seven of them and I didn't do anything. You want me to go, oh, there were seven of them and I, I didn't do, I didn't do anything didn't have anything to do with it. wasn't me. Those kind of things. So and you get a gut feeling again about whether they're being honest or not. And what I'm saying, you get a gut feeling, so that's how you tell. What I'm saying is, after a while, after you after you focus on people telling you the truth or, or being deceptive with you, you sort of get a handle on that. You get a feeling about that because people are people. Human beings are human beings. And we all act pretty much the same when it comes to those situations because nobody rehearses for that. Con man will or a, a, a grifter, as they call them, will be ready for that. They're ready to, to lie to you, they're, and they're pros at it, professional liars. And they'll they'll give you answers, and if it doesn't work, then they'll answer something else that looks so natural. So that's that's the caveat there. If you're dealing with a con, you really got to have a heads up on that. Um, at the Nashville Entrepreneur Center, when I, when I was there, that's one of the things I would look for, people coming in to take advantage of the startups. And their money situations that they'd gotten money or trying to help them or help them get money so the money would go through them or come to, into their possession somehow and they would take it or take most of it or, or whatever. So there's that. All right. Uh, have you ever thought of asking an, an unqualified woman to sit on the panel and it's talking about the behavior panel um, and give you her intuitive thoughts? I would love that position as it would be interesting to see an intuitive view without the uh, expertise. I think that's what she's trying to say, expertise. Um, we had a, a, another body language expert on there, a really good one, Tanya Ryman, and it didn't go well. It did with us. We had we had a blast, and she's really smart and really good. But the our demographic really wasn't into having another person on there, I don't think. So it kind of uh, um, made things 
weird, but we didn't know it was weird until afterwards. We started started seeing all the comments. They were like, "Oh, you don't need this," or "Why have you got another person on?" You know, all that stuff. That's what we finally decided was going on. So, but but Tanya's awesome. She really is good. Plus, when we're in between the clips that we do, it gets kind of rough as far as um, language. Sometimes it's coarse, and guys talk differently to guys than they do to women. So when a woman's around, because we respect women, we don't want to talk bad around them or or, or anything. And it's nothing bad. It's nothing about women. It's just our language is a little bit out of hand. Our vernacular leans toward the more coarse um, vernacular because we're guys, and that's what we do. So that would be, I think it would be uncomfortable for a woman to be on there because we'd be acting weird, and the reason we'd be acting weird is because we're trying to watch our mouths and not say what we really think about these some of these people we're watching. Um, and that's when it gets, that's when the graphic language comes out is when we're talking to each other about the person that we're watching that we know has done something they shouldn't have done. That's, that was bad. So there's that. All right. Uh, here's one. Let's see. How much harder is it to read people when you can only hear? I know about the trick of turning the sound off when watching someone on video, but what about looking away and just listening? Um, all right. One of the main things you want to do is listen because words are the main, the, the talking part is, is how you get most information from people. You've probably heard of the 73855 rule of communication. And you always know when you deal with a, a body language hack, when they come in, they're, I'm an expert. And they, they open up with, did you know that communication is 7% the words we use, 38% the tone of voice, and the rest is body language. 55% is body language. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. I, I first heard this back in the 80s. I was in Boston. I went to Berkeley College of Music. And somebody said, you're in the body language. Here's what I've heard. Check this out. And they told me that. I was like, man, that doesn't sound right to me. You know, like, well, that's what this is. And it was like, I was like, well, it doesn't sound right. And two or three other people came to me and said, here's this. And I kept thinking, it doesn't sound right. So I said, who, who said this? Who's the person? Where's the study on this? And they said, a guy named Albert Morabian. He's at UCLA. So I called him, found his number, and I called him up. And I said, hey, man, this this 738.55 thing does not sound right to me. What's going on with that? Will you explain it to me so I can understand it better? And he said, and he's, he's, he has an accent. And he said, but I'm not going to do it. But he said, no, listen to me. That's not true. That's not true at all. I didn't say that. What's happened is two, these people have taken two different studies of mine and put them together and somehow come out with this 738.55 rule. He said, please, if when you talk to somebody, if it comes up, tell them I said that. Tell them we talked, and I said, no, that's not true. I did not say that. So that's why it's known as the 738.55 myth, because he didn't say that at all. And before, I did, I did a TED Talk in like 2014, I think. And it was about um, those, those, you know, the myths of body language and that kind of thing. And I, I emailed him and said, hey, you may not remember me, but... I, I asked you about this a while back. Can I, I'm going to talk about you on this TED Talk. Is that cool if I use your picture and show people who you are? I said, oh, yeah, you can use it or whatever. I remember that, and I appreciate you doing that. So he's he's still down with it's not true, and he didn't say that. So there's that one. All right, let's see what's next. Um, I have a hard time watching movies or shows where the sound doesn't sync up or uh, – or with foreign films that are originally filmed in another language and dubbed in English, and the mouth doesn't sync up. Yeah, it's 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 weird. It seems uh, this is more common these days. Although it's easier than reading subtitles, it bothers me when the dialogue doesn't sync up. Uh, is this the way the human brain works, or an OCD issue on my part? It just sounds weird. It looks weird. It takes a few minutes to get to get a handle on that. You know. I did. And there's a thing called synesthesia, and I have it. For I don't know what causes it. It's like when two senses cross. And you've heard people talk about this. Where they say, "Oh, I can see sound," and they'll talk about it being in the room when they when they hear music or something. That, that's not what it is. Synesthesia happens in here, and it looks like um, if you look think about an apple, a red apple, and put it on a stick. So you see that picture you see. That's how you see sound. It's not like in the room or anything. There's a there's a uh, Lord is her name. She's a, um, a, a musician. She's a songwriter. 
had a couple of albums out or a few, I don't know anything about her, except I heard her one time on a show saying, I have synesthesia. And she started describing it like it was in the room. And she was saying, it's like, just see it in the room. It's like, it doesn't work that way. My point being, one of the tests they give you in that is they show you somebody saying, for example, a video of somebody sitting there and they'll go, I want to go fishing. But what they've dubbed over it is, I'd like to go to the store like that. And you're supposed to say, does this match up or, or not? Are they say, are they, is this what they're saying or not? Which was, I thought was pretty goofy because it was fairly obvious, but apparently some people can't tell the difference in that, which I thought was really odd. There's, there's a barrage of tests they give you as you go through that to make sure you really have it. For example, they'll play a little sound and they'll have you draw the sound. And then they'll, they play, you know, a ton of sounds and have you do that. Then they'll give you another bunch of sounds and they'll put one or two of those other ones in there to see if you draw the same picture, which I thought was brilliant. Because I was like, hey, we've heard this one. And they, they were like, yeah, we know, just go on. So you have to draw the same picture of the sound each time. But um, so, yeah, it's it's not OCD. It just looks weird to you. It takes a minute to get a, get a handle on that because you got to use, it's not that person talking. Uh, I mean, you're not hearing their voice and you know how it is. You, you want to hear what that person really sounds like. And you've got an idea what people sound like when you see them. And when it's really weird, it's really off. You know, there was, I, I used to watch those because I'd love to watch those uh, Godzilla type movies. There was one about Mothra, you know, the giant moth. And uh, they, these guys were, and there was a giant turtle. I can't remember his name. But one guy go, comes up and he goes, uh, and they found these turtle eggs, these giant turtle eggs. And he goes, and this girl goes, oh, look, I found some eggs. And, and this other girl goes, what type are they? And this guy goes, turtle, like that. It wasn't, and he, his whole mouth moved differently, as you know they do. But it just put me in the floor, and I, I and that's all I said for like two years after that. Every chance I got, what type are they? Turtle. Oh, it's hilarious. Mothra. Okay. This one? Um, my question is not, ex is not exactly about body language or related, but I can't figure out why people start a sentence uh, and say, I mean, and then they continue to say what they're going to say. It's just one of those little uh, linguistic viruses that happen when people say, like, we went to the store and like, he did this and like, I got two of these and like, it's, it's one of those. So that's no big deal. Sometimes you'll hear people say, well, before they say something and what they're doing is they're trying to buy time so they don't have to, they give them enough time to, to think of something. Doesn't seem like much time to you and me, but when someone says, well, they're thinking, and that's a whole lot of time for your brain to think because, man, it works quick, like a computer. So it helps you structure your answer and uh, think of what you're going to say. So that's what it is. It's a little linguistic uh, virus thing that people do. Uh, have you watched your own videos, specifically on YouTube, and scrutinized your mannerisms? And so, and if so, what have you changed or what would you like to change? Not that I think you should do anything differently. I'm just curious. And I, it sounds like I can't read very well because these have dyslexia really bad. Mark has it worse than I do. But um, so it's hard to read when I get this thing called the dyslexic font. And you can have it on your computer. A little, uh, I forget what they, they call them, but you put it in your browser and it makes everything on, that comes up on your browser, it puts it in that font. It's called it's called open dyslexic. That's what's called open dyslexic. And uh, so, but I, when I read a book, I, I read everything on a Kindle because open dyslexic, comes on a Kindle and you can make everything in your Kindle that font. So if you're dyslexic, check out, um, get a Kindle, check that out. Because when you start trying to read something this big, somebody gave me this book. So I had to get it on Kindle so I could read it, uh, read it quickly. I can read normally, but it takes a while as you're seeing here. So uh, just suggestion if you have dyslexia or know somebody who does, tell them that. Okay. So have I ever scrutinized my own mannerisms? No. I don't care. <laughs> I really don't. I really don't. Could not possibly care less. There's no way I could care any less. They don't look like a goof or anything, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to sit around and, and look at myself and say, hmm, I need to do that differently. I probably should. A lot of people do, especially people when they're doing, we've got speaking engagements. You've know, you got a gig doing that, but I, it's, it's not me. So I don't, I don't feel like it would, it, doesn't wouldn't feel right to me to be standing in a way I wouldn't normally stand or I wouldn't normally talk. I just can't. I decided that years ago that I wasn't going to be that guy or that person. Nothing wrong with it. it. Helps a lot of people. You should do it. 
If it's, if you think it'll help you, you should do it. I'm just saying for me personally, no, can't do it. Okay. I work in an elementary school. I want to break down and teach my students how to read body language. Why should I teach them first? Great question. You want to teach them how to observe and observe properly. That's lesson one, how to observe and what to, and what you're looking for, right? So when you observe someone, you want to, you, you want to look at the entire picture, not only at their body language, but what's going on around them. What's, what's in that situation? Is there a fire happening as you're talking to them and the place is burning down? Or is it really a calm situation? Are there a lot of people around? Is it just one or two people in a room or is it just you too? So that's the first thing to observe the, the entire situation because you're going to be decoding that in real time, that entire situation. So there can be things that affect that person outside of that conversation you're having and you being there. It, it may be um, like it's some of the things I was talking about before, but that's really important. You got to teach them how to observe just to relax and take into, uh, before you go to step two, take into consideration everything going on in the room because even just from that, you'll get a little gut feel about what's happened because that thing we talked about at the beginning about your brain, it's not going to be definitive at all, not even a little bit, but it will give you a pretty good idea of what you're dealing with, with that person, the good person, bad person, they're going to hurt me, they're not going to hurt me. And those things they'll be able to see right away, I think. I don't know what you said they were young, let's pretend they're in the first or second grade. So you want to make sure that they're, I don't know how you teach a, a child that in such a short time that we have. So I'll just say, teach them to observe and watch that person and observe everything they're doing. Then you go to uh, step two. And we'll, we'll do that in another video. All right, I'll, I'll do a thing on here where we talk about that because that's important. Good for you. Uh, can you cover how to tell the difference between a lip lick and a tongue jut? Yeah, lip lick is just this. And then you have a tongue jut, which is they come out really quickly. So in your, it's, it's like a... Quite often, there, there are a couple of, of different um, ways to look at it. You can, we, we call it mouth grooming. When someone's talking, they go like that, like I did just a second ago um, before that. And that's normal. You know, sometimes your mouth gets dry, your lips get dry, and you, you need to do that. Sometimes people do that. So those are all normal things to do. But the tongue jut is when someone you're talking to someone or they're giving you an, an answer, and in the middle of it, they do what I just did. And you see it come out. It's not just a grooming gesture. It comes out like that. But it has to be natural. I can't do it because I can't I can't get in that state where it's going to happen uh, the way it should. But that's what that's what the look it's like a lip pursing thing. When you see someone with pursed lips, quite often that suggests that indicates that person doesn't agree with what you just said, what they just heard, or what they were just presented with. So it's not like the full blown like that. That's obvious. But we see a little bitty thing like this. One of those. Look for that because that'll tell you that that will give you an idea of whether that person agrees with what you're saying or not, or if they believe you as you're talking to them. So, all right. Well, there are the first seven questions anyway. But if you have any, let me know, and we'll go over them in, in detail, uh, or as detailed as we can get on here. So, I'm trying to think of something interesting that's happened. Oh, I know, I know. I did get another question about um which that question about the body language do i ever watch my own mannerisms and stuff what i do is when i'm editing like our behavior panel stuff you know you can go through it frame by frame and yeah, you get some hilarious uh sing, you know single shots of of us like and i'll send these guys just pictures of themselves where, where they look like they're singing getting ready to sing you know the what's that song Kermit the frog sings all the time i can't remember the name of it but they're getting ready to sing a song or something that looks really goofy. So that's one thing I do when I'm going through there. Because sometimes when I'm editing, I'll just stop and somebody will have a really weird look on their face and I'll take a picture or I'll do a screen grab and then send it to everybody. And then I got this thing called the Fad App. And so what you do there is you put somebody's picture in it and it makes them like really, really big. And it's, just, it's, it, it's You can tell it's fake, but like cartoon size, big in their face. So I'll, send, I'll do that and send that. I usually send a lot of those of me. So, because, God, they look horrible. Maybe I'll put one on here and let you see it. Because they're bad. People always ask what books to read. There's a lot of great books out there on body language. If you're a beginner and you're just starting, 
There's one, and it's a classic now, Joe Navarro did, called What Everybody Is Saying. Great book. If you want to start off in body language, you're just one, if you're going to get one book, that's the one to get because he covers everything in there. And you, can, and you can go back to it. I don't know where mine is, but I go through it all the time. And it's, um, even though it's, 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 it's got pretty much everything in it. So that's what I, I would suggest to get that. Another good one would be any of the Paul Ekman books are really good. Um, Unmasking the Face, that's a good one. That talks about uh, facial expressions. And those are really good. And he's a great writer. You know, it's, it's easy to read. Um, what else would be a good one? There's so many good ones out there. Well, if you have any questions and you want to know anything else about body language, let me know. Just email me, bodylanguagequestions at gmail.com. And I'll take a look at them and answer them. So, all right. If you have any other questions, just let me know. I'll see you next time.